Sybil is essentially an AI assistant for sales reps. The way it basically assists sales reps is by being like an assistant that sits right next to you, is there on every single call that you take, every single email that you send. It has visibility into your CRM, into your inbox. And based on that, it helps you with a bunch of things. Everyone's doing virtual meetings now, but there's a dearth of tools that actually look at and understand what's happening in a conversation. What are the good, bad, and ugly parts of the conversation? That's how the idea of Sybil took birth. What if we could understand everything that's happening in the call? Not just the transcription, but also what does everyone's intent look like? What does their body language tell us about what they're going to do next? This is a problem a lot of uh, startups have. Hey, I built my product, but I'm not really getting customers. You know, what am I doing wrong? I think a lot of it has to do with like, as you're building the product, you want to get users as soon as possible. Even though your product looks ugly, you know, it may not solve all the pain points that your customer mm -hmm. needs to get solved. But still, you should keep hunting for users, get a few users, get their feedback and basically have them on as like a user or a customer advisory board that you can ping every two weeks whenever you have updates ask them for feedback you guys were doing about hundred thousand dollars in revenue around 2023 and yeah. from there you just got on to a million dollars how did that happen I would say it's uh, a lot of it is uh, due to two factors. Uh, one is that product innovation. We were the fastest to launch call summaries and we're still the most accurate when it comes to the call summaries that we have. You build something, get some users, learn from it, learn what are the bad parts of your baby and then you fix them. <laughs> and then you go back again and ask users for feedback. So keep hydrating. Yeah. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to a new episode of uh, Driven by DC Cap. I'm your host, Karthik Chidambaram, CEO of DC Cap. We make systems, talk to each other for manufacturers and distributors. We are here in Mountain View, California. Being in Silicon Valley, let's talk about AI. We are here with Nishit Asnani, co-founder of Sybil.ai. Thanks so much for joining this uh, Driven podcast. Uh, looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation today as well. And I'm excited to join you, Karthik. Big fan of your work and uh, super, super awesome to be on this podcast. And I'm really happy to have you as a customer as well. So, Nishit, thank you so much again. Uh, thanks for your time. You know, we are a happy customer with Sybil. Enjoy using your product. So, thank you for your great work. But uh, tell us for the audience uh, who are not very familiar with Sybil. Can you tell us about what Sybil does and how does it differentiate from some other similar products in the market? Absolutely. So uh, Sybil is essentially an AI assistant for sales reps. The way we kind of think about it is it's like a Jarvis to the Iron Man in you. Um, and uh, the way it basically assists sales reps is by like being like an assistant that sits right next to you is there on every single call that you take, every single email that you send. It has visibility into your CRM, into your inbox. And based on that, it helps you with a bunch of things. Firstly, uh, it takes notes during your calls. It digests them into a format that is easily usable by everyone on your team, sends updates to your manager, to your uh, CRO, to your executives, and so on. It writes all of those updates right in your CRM, whether you use Salesforce, HubSpot, whatever that is, so that you uh, everyone is up to date. Uh, and in addition, it writes your follow-up emails in your own style, in your own tone of voice as well. So essentially, it takes care of all the backend work so you can focus on taking more customer calls and being more present in those conversations and closing more deals. I love the actionable insights. You know, one way I use the product is because obviously our teams uh, do the calls and I really want to see, sometimes if I want to see what they really did, instead of listening through the whole call, I just listen to the, I just read the Sybil summary mm -hmm. and it really helps and then I just go to that particular instant and use it. But is there a reason why you guys chose sales when we when you were building this AI product? Yeah, absolutely. So I can go a little bit into the origin story. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> me and my co-founders, we were actually toying around with the idea of how we can make the digital world much more accessible, especially during the pandemic. So we started in the summer of 2020. And uh, during that time, Goresh, who was my co-founder and CEO, he was teaching a course at Stanford. And after just two classes of teaching online, uh, he was like, it's so much easier to teach in person because in virtual meetings, even if all your students have their cameras on, you don't have the time or the or the luxury to look at their faces and figure out if your content is resonating or not. And that gave birth to the idea of that everyone's doing virtual meetings now, but there's a dearth of tools that actually look at and understand what's happening in a conversation. What are the good, bad, and ugly parts of the conversation? That's how the idea of Sybil took birth. What if we could understand everything that's happening in a call, not just the transcript description but also what does everyone's intent look like what does their body language tell us about what they're going to do next and so on so we started building out the system there and as we had conversations with people across the board from different disciplines different verticals we realized that salespeople absolutely love the idea of what we were trying to do and they pounced on our initial demos that hey if you can build this out 
the, I can find a lot of value because I want to understand what my prospect is thinking and doing during the call. And then after the call, be able to communicate with them accordingly and close the deals faster. So that was how we kind of got into B2B sales as our target market. And over the next couple of years, both Goresh and I got on like about 500 or so sales calls <laughs> uh, with, with individual sales reps and their managers and understood their entire breadth of problems and realized that understanding uh, people's behaviors and reactions in the call was a small part of the overall puzzle and we could really help them solve the entire gamut of things that they have to do uh, along with selling. So that's kind of like how we got into B2B sales. So 2020 to 2022, you were doing more of uh, research, trying to find the product market fit, yes. what's really working, what uh, niche area you want to get into and that's when you decided you're going to get into sales, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And all the four co-founders were roommates? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were all uh, we were all roommates, and um, it's uh, it's funny. So Gorish and I were classmates at Stanford um, before we started. Uh, Shamarko became a roommate. He he was studying at UC San Diego, and one mutual friend connected us to him, and then he eventually moved to the Bay Area and uh, started living with us, and um, also started working on the startup. And Mehek, who's our fourth co-founder, she is, in fact, Gorisha's sister. And so she was uh, doing her internship at Howard, and then she moved uh, here during the pandemic as well. And we started living together, and then we started working together on what eventually became Sybil. So Sybil.ai, you know, talking about AI, I mean, I can really see this is a very practical use of how AI is being used, right? Because, you know, so there's been a lot of buzz about AI, AI, but where exactly are we using it? This is a question a lot of people have. But essentially, right, so Sybil is a great example of how it can practically make your life easier, where you listen through all the sales calls and you give us actionable insights. Hey, let's say if I need to send a note to the customer back or if I need to send a proposal, Sybil tells me that, hey, I need to send a proposal to the customer. And if everybody is connected in Sybil, you know, it just makes it more uh, streamlined. So what is the technology behind that, right? So when you guys decided, okay, two years you worked on the product and you said, okay, you're going to target the sales uh, market. So what actually goes behind the scenes? Can you tell us about the technology behind Sybil? Absolutely. So the number one uh, data source that we have is your own customer calls, right? And so in the customer calls, we're doing a couple of things. Uh, we're understanding what each person is saying and transcribing it. At the same time, uh, Sybil is also uh, figuring out the levels of engagement and excitement that each person is showing by looking at their smiling, nodding, and all of these other facial cues. And then combining these two sources of information, the non-verbal and the verbal, uh, to figure out, okay, what is this person's intent? Uh, how likely are they going to buy? What are the key things that they are they have pain points around? What are the key objections that they had and so on? And this, uh, and then, so we kind of encapsulate all of this data, uh, figure out what's most important, and then use that to create a summary for the call. That's how we get to uh, the call outcome, the next steps, uh, the pain points, areas of interest, and so on. Now, what happens is once you have these insights on each call, uh, Sybil also understands this data across the entire deal. So if you've had, let's say, five calls and 15 email exchanges with, let's say, Acme Corp, Sybil will understand all of that data in one go. Uh, and that, based on that, it will create a deal level summary for you, uh, which will correspond to your own sales process, whether you follow, let's say, a band or a met pick or any other sales process, Sybil can understand that and contextualize the entire deal for you in that format. Uh, so you can take action on it, whether you're the sales rep leading the deal or whether you're their manager or whether you're the CEO who's looking at where each deal is at. So you talked about non-verbal cues. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of diversity involved there, you know, male, female. How are you guys doing that? You know, how are you analyzing the video? Is it your own software or are you using a third-party tool? How are you also making sure that diversity is taken into account there? Absolutely. So um, it is primarily our own software that we've built over the first couple of years. So a lot of the times, like, it's not about going from like a raw uh, video of a face <laughs> to figure, to engagement. There's a lot of steps in between. So the first thing is we try to understand uh, the key points on the face. And there's like uh, some 34 key points on the face that you need to kind of have an understanding of and track for every single millisecond as to how the face shape is changing. And not just the face, but also the rest of the upper body that get, that you show in Zoom or Gmeet meetings. Then from there, uh, as we track these points, then we have algorithms and that uh, from these points and these kind of temporal movements try to figure out whether this person was nodding or smiling or frowning or leaning away or leaning in and mm -hmm. so on. And uh, capture a bunch of these nonverbal reactions. And then we have further algorithms on top that aggregate these nonverbal reactions to then label uh, every single moment in the call as 
is this person interested is this person excited is or frustrated or engaged or distracted whatever that is and that is what you eventually see in the call summaries uh, where we are able to then contextualize these um, reactions to what was being discussed in the call. So if let's say you were nodding heavily when I was demoing the HubSpot integration to you, mm. uh, then Sybil uh, will be reasonable in trying to deduce that you are somehow interested in the HubSpot integration. And mm. then it will find more evidence from the call to figure out if that is true or not. And you've talked about transcribing the calls as well, right? Is that, again, the, your own technology or using somebody else's uh, product and then using APIs and doing that? How are you doing that? Yeah, so we have uh, third-party vendors that help us in transcription. We have our own technology behind it as well to mm -hmm. um, make sure that all, like, the right sentences mm -hmm. are attributed to the right speakers. And then uh, we have uh, a further pipeline wherein we figure out uh, the intent of each person, we figure out the sort of social hierarchy within the buying committee, mm -hmm. if there's multiple buyers out there, uh, and to figure out the strength of the buying intent, and that eventually leads to the summaries. If you remember, in the old days, let's say if I really want to get into tech or software, they say you got to really be good at C, C++, mm -hmm. but now AI is a new thing. Let's say if I want to be really, really good at AI, what should I start with? Be really good at using AI first and foremost okay. <laughs> <laughs> before building it. I think there's a, you can cover a lot of ground just by getting really good at uh, mm -hmm. prompting these LLMs like ChatGPT and Claude in a way that you're able to get them to do the stuff for you. What I've found is like, like a lot of people try to be like, okay, how can I make a Claude? But before that, can you get Claude to, or ChatGPT to do the stuff that you're trying to do? Uh, an example uh, recently uh, was that um, I was trying to prepare for like a, customer call and it was a major customer call and I was like uh, I know this person can become a detractor if I don't take this well and answer their objections properly so it's not like I need to fine tune an LLM to do anything of that sort uh, I basically sat down and spent like 15-20 minutes just writing an amazing prompt that gave uh, chat GPT all the context about the person about their company, about my relationship with the person and the company, uh, about my product, about how we sell them, about what I want out of the conversation, and what are the major objections that I think we are going to face. And uh, I traded a couple of times on that, and I was able to, with ChatGPT's audio, I was able to run a pretty solid role play with it. And role playing with it for like 15, 20 minutes gave, it, gave me the confidence that, hey, I can ace this call. And that's what happened as well. So... It's just first get really good at using it and get really good at figuring out what are the gaps here. Um, and, and then that can help you get better at programming over time. Because now I don't think you should be starting from scratch. You can actually learn a lot just by interacting with ChatGPT, asking it to give you constructive feedback, being a tutor, being like an interactive sort of teacher for you. And that way you can get really, really better at programming. So prompting is very important. So you got to really start using AI first to build uh, AI. Yeah. So you guys are doing this for sales. Yeah. Right. So let's say I want to do this for HR or somebody else wants to do it for something else. What should they do? How can they copy you? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very important to figure out whether like what's the simplest solution to whatever problem you want to solve. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, it's I think it's, it's definitely about sales or HR or whatever vertical mm -hmm. that is, but it's way more about like uh, what's the simplest solution to the problems that I want to solve for the mm -hmm. customers. And if the solution is simply mm -hmm. having uh, smart prompts for your LLM, then that's the easiest. Obviously, that does not solve all the major queries that uh, mm -hmm. your customers may have. And so you may decide that, okay, I want to go deeper. So then beyond that, then you have to build retrieval systems. Mm -hmm. So what's like basically a trend over the last one, one and a half years is people are building retrieval augmented generation or RAG systems across the board. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of flavors of how you can build a RAG system. Mm -hmm. A RAG system is basically a system that digests all of the data context documents that you have about uh, about the space uh, or about let's say in civil scenario about a specific sales deal and uh, organizes it in a fashion that it's easily accessible and then whenever the customer asks a question or wants to fill out a certain thing like hey what's the budget for this deal then the rag system goes on accesses all that information and tries to figure out what is the most relevant part um, of information that can help answer this question and then comes back with it. So it's different from using an LLM right off the bat because you have to give it a lot more context for the rack to be effective. So yeah, that's the next level of doing things. And then the even further than that, the next level is if you like, you really want to get into and fine tune the model, then you'll have to create, compile your own data sets, fine tune the LLM to be much more specific to your domain and then serve the customers based on that. So how long did it take for you guys to build the initial product, right? Because you said for a couple of years, you did market research, you went and talked to customers, talked to a lot of salespeople, tried to find it. Okay, you decided that sales is what I'm going to attack and tackle. How long did it take for you to build the actual core product? 
we actually started uh, uh, building the product uh, as soon as uh, we started the company. So while we were having a lot of conversations with the customers, mm -hmm. we were also building the product and testing it out uh, mm -hmm. on the side, even though we were not charging for it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we got some of our early users. It was primarily brute force, just mm -hmm. reaching out to people on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and being like, hey, do you want to try this out? There's something sure. new. And then as people used it, we got to learn a lot more about like what needs to be there in the core product as mm -hmm. we are talking about, right? Like uh, we can't just be building a core product with drops of engagement. We need to go deeper and deeper and create more interactive summaries and things like that. So that's kind of like how uh, we got in that road. And uh, we already had a summarization platform uh, before uh, the end of 2022, which is when ChatGPT launched. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, so we were able to figure out the key components of a call uh, the buying intent, the social hierarchy, the political discourse, and so on from a conversation. But the summaries were not the most easily readable. And then, and we had a few early customers as well. And then the flip switched because once GPT 3.5 was launched, which is the model that powered ChatGPT at that point, we saw that this could cause a step change in how digestible our call summaries were. So we plugged it at the end of our AI pipeline, got amazing results, and we were the first in the sales tech space to launch call summaries um, back in December of 2022. And then we quickly realized that let's say we nailed call summaries. What do we do next? We uh, after digesting a summary of a call, the sales rep wants to send a follow up email, right? Uh, they want to carry the conversation forward and move the deal forward. So we started building follow up emails, and then we started building deal summaries and so on. So I would say that our core product, like um, there were some inclinations of it in 2022, but a lot of the stuff got built in 2023, and now we are kind of going to the next stage of what our core product is going to look like. We've expanded the scope of what we want Sybil to be doing based on what our customers have been telling us and where the industry is going. And so probably if you ask me the same question next year, I would say the core product is being built right now in 2025. <laughs> you guys have done uh, very impressive work in the last four years. So let's say somebody is starting out. Right? This is a problem a lot of uh, startups have. Hey, I built my product, but I'm not really getting customers. So what do I do? You know, What am I doing wrong? I think that's, that's a hole that a lot of it, especially technical founders, do get into uh, because they're, they're much faster at building product than getting customers. And we also had that problem for some time. I think a lot of it has to do with, like, as you're building the product, you want to get users as soon as possible, even though your product looks ugly mm -hmm. and uh, it may not solve all the pain points that it, mm -hmm. your customer needs to get solved. But still, you should keep hunting for users, get a few users, get their feedback, and basically have them on as like a user or a customer advisory board that you can ping every week, every two weeks, whenever you have updates, and uh, ask them for feedback. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how you learn. And eventually, you get to a point where the product is retentive, and at least there is at least some non-zero number of users who visit the product every single day or every single week. And, uh, and then there's a... You can iterate a lot more, not just based on qualitative feedback, but actual usage data. Um, and based on how users are interacting with it, you can learn a lot more about what they want. So I think it's a much more iterative process than being a step change that, hey, I build the product first, and then once the product is done, then I try to get customers. Uh, a lot of the times, especially in the early stages, the the stage where you don't have product market fit, it's much more iterative. You build something, get some users, learn from it, learn what are the bad parts of your baby and then you fix them <laughs> and then you go back again and ask users for feedback so keep hydrating yeah yeah so we work with a lot of manufacturers and distributors you guys do Sibo for sales can you tell us some practical uses of how manufacturers and distributors can leverage ai for their day-to-day -day work i think there's a there's a lot of like um, low-hanging fruit um, when it comes to leveraging ai for day-to-day -day work so uh, for instance if you were taking a bunch of customer calls or partner calls on a daily basis obviously use sybil uh, to record the <laughs> calls and get call summaries but even beyond that uh, as i was telling earlier uh, you can use uh, a chat GPT with like an audio interface to do role plays or coach yourself on how you can do better. Something that I've done in the past that's helped me quite a lot is like taking the transcript of a customer call that I had, or let's say a sales rep on my team had, feeding it into uh, an LLM like chat GPT or Claude and asking it a very pointed, very pointed set of questions uh, to give me feedback on what I could have done better or what kind of questions could I have asked that I did not ask in my discovery conversations. And that helps me get better as a seller and also in general in terms of communicating with uh, potential customers. So that those are like some very baseline things. Some of the other things I've used it for, obviously like a lot of people say about content generation and uh, a lot of people try to generate content for a website and blogs and uh, LinkedIn and so on uh, to grow their presence. Mm. Uh, I think 
uh, these systems are getting better at mm-hmm. it, but they're still not there where, uh, I mean, you can still distinguish between authentic content written by a real human being like Karthik. Mm-hmm. If you were to write a LinkedIn post, that's still, mm-hmm. you can see that it's more authentic. But there are certain other types of content where AI is super impactful. There are tools right now that you can use, like Superhuman and Fixer, that help you respond to emails, and they're pretty on point and follow your style of how you respond to emails. You can obviously use Sybil for following up on customer mm-hmm. conversations and those emails and so on. Uh, you can use these other tools for email follow-ups. Um, and you can also use uh, AI to generate day-to-day content. Like if, if you're someone who needs to generate project proposals every day, you can use AI to generate those um, as long as you have a really strong prompt. And what I see is a lot of people give up on AI for generating content or for responding to emails or for do, having feedback and so on because they give a first prompt and the answer they get from chat GPT is pretty generic. And the key to unlocking the real value is spend more time in honing the prompt and the context that you're giving the AI system. Instead of spending a minute to write a prompt, spend 15 minutes to write that prompt. Give yourself that target that helps you because if your end goal is that you want to be much more efficient, there's no better hack right now out there (laughs) than to use AI to solve a bunch of your problems uh, that you can. And so it's worthwhile investing that much time and effort into creating the right prompt, creating the right context, uh, giving it feedback, helping it, helping it help you. Outside of content generation, do you see any other use cases, let's say, at manufacturing or at distribution? So, uh, as I said, like, uh, content generation is one part of the things. Sure. Another thing is, like, as a, um, as we we're trying to build Sybil towards a thought partner, that's important. Like, for instance, uh, I used uh, ChatGPT just a couple of days back to go back and forth on my marketing strategy for the next quarter. <laughs> it was like, I had a few different ideas and a few different problems that we faced in the previous quarter. And I was like, hey, based on this, can you can you help me come up with, okay, what should we even try doing? Mm-hmm. And give it the constraints that, hey, these are the human constraints. These are the capital constraints. What can we do here? Got some initial ideas. At the end of the day, it's my job to craft that strategy. But AI can help get me started. Mm -hmm. Um, A few weeks back, I used it to get some ideas on creative ways to leverage an event. I was going to an event and I was like, I just don't want to be another face among 2,000 other people. I want to go there with something Mm -hmm. interesting, an interesting value proposition, an interesting piece of collateral. What Mm -hmm. could that be? Mm -hmm. And it gave me a bunch of ideas. So those are just just things in like everyday life that as a a distributor, Mm -hmm. uh, like there are things that you, there are problems that you need to solve. And with every single problem, you should probably think about, hey, if it is going to take me two or three hours, is there any way I can reduce that time to half an hour or 15 minutes using AI? And if that is possible, what would I need to get there? Okay. Another, I think, less used aspect of AI tools is that if you connect them to the right data source, and this comes back to your value proposition <laughs> as DC cap, right? If you connect them to the right data sources, you are not just restricted to the prompts that you give you can actually use the data that you have in your own systems of record Mm -hmm. and get amazing output out of it. So for instance, like a very popular use case is if you connect your uh, an LLM to your customer support engine Mm -hmm. and to your CRM, let's say HubSpot, and let's say to your Mm -hmm. uh, knowledge base, and then ask it questions that are at the intersection of all of these. Like, hey, this customer is asking for this particular feature and how to use it. Do we have any documentation on it? And the AI system can help you answer it. This can really speed up and make the job of your team or your or your own self and your own conversations much more faster and efficient. Make systems talk to each other. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you guys were doing about hundred thousand dollars in revenue uh, around 2023, and uh, and yeah. from there you just got on to a million dollars. So that's very very fast growth. How did that happen? I would say it's uh, a lot of it is uh, due to two factors. Uh, one is that product innovation. We were the fastest uh, to launch call summaries and we are still the most accurate when it comes to the call summaries that we have. Similarly, we were the fastest to launch other uh, defining AI products like AI follow-up emails and deal summaries as well. And we've continued to remain the most innovative and on the frontier of sales tech um, since then. And it's not just about being fastest in terms of developing technology, but also integrating that into the product in a way that the product doesn't get too complex or hard to use. It's still easy to use, very easy for a new person to onboard themselves and get to the mm-hmm. aha moment quickest. And that's what we focused on. Um, and that's helped us a lot uh, in terms of uh, growing that customer base quickly. Because our promise is that, hey, you got to use this amazing technology and this is going to solve these very important use cases for you as a sales rep. And then when a sales rep actually tries out the product, they see it happen within the first couple of hours of using the product. So uh, they want to keep using it and keep spreading the word in their team and refer other people. Which brings me to the second reason why we've grown fast, which is that our customers are amazing. They have not just kind of adopted Sybil 
uh, they've enjoyed using the product and they've been vocal about how how useful it's been for them and they have uh, and referrals has been a huge channel for us in order to get new customers. Most of our customers have referred at least someone else to try using the product. Some of them have referred many, many, many people, and that's helped us get a lot of new revenue as well. And like, while it's it's easy to say that, hey, the product is great, I think a lot of the credit goes to our customers who have been super supportive, super helpful. Uh, they've given us amazing feedback and also great new customers uh, as well through their referrals. So it's mostly product-led growth yes. so far, yeah? Yes. And how big is the technology team? So we are, um, mm. I think, about uh, a dozen folks in, in product and tech. You guys recently raised $11 million, so mm. congratulations on that. Thank you. So what are you going to do with the money? <laughs> <laughs> If you think about our vision, it's we're trying to um, be uh, the Jarvis for a sales rep, which is um, in the ideal world, we want to be a thought partner. So if let's say I'm a sales rep and I have several sitting right mm -hmm. next to me, I wanted to not just do the back end stuff for me, which mm -hmm. I'm just doing right now. I also wanted to help me with deal strategies. Mm -hmm. I wanted to help me with, hey, this is the next step you should take to move this deal forward. I wanted to also do a lot of the internal communication of like, when I want something from product team, Sybil takes the initiative, goes in Slack, texts the product team that, hey, can you send me this? Or text the marketing team, hey, can you send this case study? Or can you make this case study? And things like that. So it's kind of like a true assistant that I can ask to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. uh, it also creates collaterals for me, creates pricing quotes, creates um, kind of competitor battle cards and so on. So, and we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. We are probably like 5% of the way to becoming a true thought partner, a true AI assistant to the sales rep. And so the focus for this fundraise is to build towards that, get closer towards being a true AI assistant to the sales rep, uh, while uh, also being super, super focused on our end uh, user, which is a sales rep, um, and solving for them. Uh, we would consider ourselves really successful if we are able to boost their quota attainment and their income, uh, not just by 10, 20%, but hopefully by 2 to 3x. That's kind of like what we want to get towards. Uh, and that's a lofty goal that might take a, a few years, but uh, we believe we can get there. And that's that's our core focus with this raise. So for this, we would need to obviously expand our customer base. We would need to build a lot of core fundamental functionalities into the product uh, and keep innovating on the technology side of things. How do you allocate capital? You know, do you have like a playbook in terms of, hey, this percentage is going to be put on sales, this percentage is going to be put on product? How do you do that? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of it like, okay, what are the key milestones that we want to hit with this capital in the next couple of years? What would help us get to the next yeah. stage and de-risking the next set of big risks to the company? Yeah. And then based on that, like what do we want to achieve? Um, on the product side, we want to de-risk building certain technologies and building a product that's actually able to have a certain win rate. On the go-to-market side, we want to be able to build a scalable motion that helps us get customers at a certain rate and limit churn. And so um, it's about like figuring out those milestones first and then going back from there as you, okay, in order to hit them, what are the uh, human as well as other resources that we need to get there? Uh, and obviously, uh, like our investors and advisors help a lot of that as well. So you live in the Bay Area and you operate from the Bay Area. How important do you think is Bay Area today, right? Is it the same as it was, let's say, 10 years ago where they say you have to be in the Bay Area to run a product or, you know, it's, it, it offers significant advantages. Do you see the same thing today or? I think things have definitely changed from 10 years ago um, in the sense uh, and in, in a few senses and in some other senses, they are basically the same. <laughs> So how is how have things changed is that I think especially in certain domains, uh, talent is more distributed. Mm -hmm. So earlier it used to be that you would only get really high quality engineers in the Bay Area. Now that's not necessarily mm -hmm. the case. A lot of the high quality engineers are still in the Bay Area, but you also find mm -hmm. more uh, talent elsewhere as well if you can look for it. And I think because of COVID, people have become more open uh, to also buying more remotely. And that was basically the initial bet on which mm -hmm. we started the company. So in terms of acquiring customers, for sure, it's much more uh, I would say democratized. Uh, that being said, uh, there are certain things that uh, have stayed true even today. This, e even today, there's a significant advantage, uh, especially for uh, a core team to be in the Bay Area, because like a lot of the industry events happen here. A lot of the conversations with uh, relevant uh, veterans in the industry, uh, with uh, potential investors, with existing investors, a lot of those conversations still happen here in person, and you learn a lot just by interacting with people. Uh, on a serendipitous note somewhere like walking down Castro Street in Mountain View and you meet a customer or you meet an advisor and then you have a 10-minute conversation and that opens up doors to a new ways of thinking. And those are things that were true 10 years ago, they're still true today. And that those, I think, are some significant advantages. 
um that being said uh, it's not uh, it's not the end all be all and <laughs> i think uh, great companies can be built from other places as well uh, i i definitely think that uh, being the bay area definitely helps uh, us uh, at civil uh, to be able to do that and you went to iit kanpur tell us about your iit kanpur days i have been to kanpur as well i went to kalyanpuram mm-hmm. kalyanpuram i went to kanpur i also visited the rajiv motwani building so mm-hmm. it was a great experience mm-hmm. tell us about your experience at iit kanpur i didn't study there but just went there <laughs> but tell us your experience of uh, iit kanpur yeah it was fantastic <laughs> <laughs> i think the undergraduate years are amazing because you develop as a person and uh, figure out your own interests and uh, for me iit kanpur was an uh, amazing experience uh, for that for those reasons uh, so i was in the computer science department i did my bachelor's in cs and uh, did a minor in english literature which was also fun uh, <laughs> um i'm very grateful that i had some amazing uh, teachers professors and uh, even more grateful that i had an amazing group of friends uh with whom uh, i think i've i've learned a lot and uh, that has shaped uh, a lot of the um, a, a lot of what i am today i think uh, some of the key takeaways for me of like like why it was amazing to be at iit kanpur first and foremost i think just developing that inner circle that group of uh, folks who are really curious really want to learn and are intellectually driven and get stuff done which was uh, which is something that has shaped a part of my personality quite a lot and i wouldn't have been an entrepreneur if not for that uh secondly i think i learned a lot about myself and about what i enjoyed doing i got really deep into the underpinnings of computer science and uh, and really enjoyed doing research in that field i had some amazing mentors professors there that helped me get there and uh, I'm, I'll forever be grateful for that because um, without that, I wouldn't have been here in the Bay Area and would not have started Sibyl and uh, truly was an amazing experience that way. Um, Kanpur itself is a very interesting city. <laughs> uh, it has its own quirks uh, and its own uh, amazing adventures that you can have there. So, yeah. The theme of this podcast is driven. How are you driven? I think I derive a lot of my drive uh, from um, learning. Um, so... I think as long as I'm learning new things and exploring my curiosity I feel like I've accomplished something in the day and I'm I'm being true to myself. Mm-hmm. Uh and so and that's what I enjoy a lot about being a startup founder yeah. because there's no shortage of learnings. <laughs> <laughs> every day uh, or uh, every other day you get hit in the face with a new uh, almost company killing problem to solve and then you have to solve it and then you solve it and then you move on. and that's i think the accumulation of these experiences is what eventually helps you truly get better hopefully hopefully we are doing better uh, from our mistakes uh, and uh, and also add true value to the people who work with you uh, as in like the other folks the team members as well as the people who you are serving as customers so i i i truly enjoy the learning and the impact um, and that's what drives me every day uh the other thing i think is um i am fairly competitive and winning really drives <laughs> me quite a bit as well so uh closing a deal with an important customer or uh closing a really important hire and these kind of things also give me a lot of joy uh, not just because i'm learning a lot but also it gives me a sense of accomplishment that okay we 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 move one step closer to de-risking something important or to hitting the next milestone and so yeah you write poetry as well what do you do outside of work points <laughs> <laughs> sometimes yes uh in general i enjoy reading and writing a lot um so back in undergrad i used to write a lot of short stories uh, even before that uh, when i was in uh, school um back in bhopal i used to write novels uh <laughs> over time i think uh, uh, i have uh, i haven't had the time to write novels but i've definitely had the time to write poetry sometimes um in my free time like apart from writing and reading i do enjoy going on drives uh, california is a great place to do that <laughs> so uh yeah enjoy being in nature close to the beach and and so on and having a good time with friends and family let's talk a little bit about writing because i think that's very interesting uh, do you guys have a writing culture at sibo and how important is writing you think i think it really varies um across the team uh, some uh, like for me writing is important in a work context particularly because i think better when i write down my thoughts mm-hmm. and and writing really helps me refine my thought process and get to the depths of what i really want mm-hmm. to get to uh, which just uh, kind of brainstorming my head mm-hmm. 
sometimes doesn't get me there. And then secondly, also, there was also one of the reasons why uh, I started leading marketing at Sybil because I really enjoyed writing and I thought I could have a huge impact uh, trying to attract uh, a new set of customers to Sybil. Uh, and I enjoy that part of my day-to-day -day work quite a lot. Um, <laughs> right? uh, copywriting is fun, especially more so when you get results out of it. So uh, so that's there. I think we do have a, uh, I, I wouldn't say we have like a very strict writing culture mm -hmm. at Sybil, but we do have a pretty decent culture where people, because like um, half of our team is remote, we do have a pretty strong culture where people are um, able to communicate properly on Slack and email and so on and uh, express their thoughts. We do use uh, asynchronous messaging. We do use asynchronous video messaging quite a lot as well, uh, sharing Loom videos with, uh, with teammates to kind of move projects further. Um, and I think that's pretty efficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you write a journal as well? Yes. And how long have you been writing journals? I think it's been at least 13-ish years. 13-ish years? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So you write every day? I don't write every day. Uh, I definitely write when there's like a big moment and I'm mm. feeling emotionally overwhelmed. I'm really happy or really sad moments. <laughs> <laughs> and I do write when I want to clear my head and put some thoughts on paper. And you have the, let's say you want to go back like 10 years, you know, you can do that easily. You have all that? Yes. Very nice. I would like to end with this question, Nishit. Uh, what book are you reading right now? So, uh, so I'm re reading this book called The Innovator's Dilemma. I think it's a very popular Silicon Valley textbook, so to say. <laughs> but yeah, I'm reading that because we're working on some company level strategy right now. And I think it's a, it's a solid book written initially in the 90s. And uh, some, many of the principles are still valid today. So, Nishit, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed this conversation on Sybil and AI, Sybil.ai. Thank you so much. Great chatting with you. Great chatting with you as well, Karthik. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Driven Podcast. Check out our other episodes for more and subscribe to be the first to access every new episode.